morning is John 20. This will be very familiar story to you. It is the the what happens after Jesus dies, according to John, and it takes place at the tomb. I'm reading from the Common English Bible. If you've not tried that translation, it's a wonderful translation. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. Mary stood outside near the tomb, crying, As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw the two angels dressed in white seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Well, now I know about how old most of you are. (laughs) because you have to be of a certain generation to know that song. (laughs) Over the course of my ministry, I've been called upon to perform many memorial services, and I'd say at least half of those who are grieving the loss of an elderly person ask that we sing that hymn. Often they don't even know the name of it. They refer to it as the garden or walking with Jesus or something, but All they have to do is start describing it, and I know, especially if they say it was my mother's favorite hymn, (laughs) and I know what it is. Well, don't tell anybody, but I always 
flinched inwardly when that song was requested. It seemed to me to be a saccharine sweet love song with little to no theological usefulness, and it perpetrated an individualistic me and Jesus piety, which I believe is anti-gospel. <laughs> Not that I feel strongly about it. <laughs> On the other hand, I understand the emotional draw to this song. I can see how it would be comforting to imagine Jesus walking beside us and talking with us, especially at a time of grief. I can't tell you what a surprise it was then when I was working on an Easter sermon one year and that song popped into my head, like an earworm, <laughs> like a bad earworm. It would not let me go. So after trying unsuccessfully to dislodge it by listening to all manner of different kinds of music, I relented to my subconscious and I Googled it. Now, is that an anachronism or what? <laughs> I thought that maybe if I looked at the lyrics a little bit more, I might discover that there was something in the hymn that was trying to speak to me. It was worth a shot. I couldn't write a, song, a sermon with that dang song in my head anyway. Well, the song actually goes perfectly with this particular scripture lesson that I read, John's version of the resurrection for it is a song reflecting Mary Magdalene's experience of the events of that first Easter morning. Seeing Jesus tortured and murdered two days before this scene takes place was especially devastating to Mary because she had a special connection to Jesus. After all, Jesus rescued her from an affliction of mental illness, perhaps, that was in that day attributed to being possessed by demons. And Mary had seven demons, according to Mark and Luke. So she had been a follower of Jesus since he freed her from those demons. He was her hero. He saved her. And she doesn't know how to stop reaching out for him. Being with him, learning from him, serving him has become her life. In fact, I would bet that she doesn't know how to live without him. But that's another song. <laughs> now, Mary is on a mission. She has come to perform the duties of the deceased's family. In this version of the story, no one else has come to do that. She comes alone to the tomb and is the first to discover that it's, it is empty. After she runs to tell Peter, she returns. And after Peter and another disciple, the one Jesus loved, examine the tomb, find the wrappings of death still sitting inside, and retreat to their home in confusion, Mary remains at the site, alone and weeping. She stoops and looks inside and discovers two angels sitting there. They listen to her expressions of grief. And then Mary, still in tears, turns around and sees a man standing behind her. She thinks he must be the caretaker. So she asks him to tell her where he has taken the body. She is so immersed in her sadness and confusion that she fails to realize that the risen Lord is standing right in front of her. Her grief is so confusing and consuming that it isn't until Jesus calls her by name, Mary, that she realizes who he is. And she exclaims, teacher. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. 
and the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever We've all experienced grief following a loss in our own lives at some point or another. Imagine being submersed in the shock, the unreality, and the darkness of the crushing grief that would surely accompany witnessing the unexpected and horrifying death of someone you love. And then imagine that person suddenly materialized in front of you. What's the first thing you would do? Ask how the food is in heaven? Talk about the weather? You would want to hug that person as tightly as you possibly could and hold on for dear life in case they disappear. When my son was very small, he managed to disappear in a department store when I had been standing not more than a couple of feet away. I called for him louder and louder and then asking for help from others. I ran around the floor looking everywhere for him. I was in a major panic that he had been kidnapped, and I'm looking at the doors that are far away from me to see if anybody's going out those doors with my child. Even though there was a part of me that realized that wasn't possible since I was right there, and there hadn't been enough time for something like that to happen. I was a crazed mother anyway. And then there he was sitting right smack in the middle of one of those circular racks of clothes, a step behind where I'd been standing and calling. He was playing hide-and-seek, but he didn't tell me. I was so relieved, and I'll bet some of you have had that same experience. It's just You can't imagine the kind of panic. I squeezed him so tightly that he cried out, Mommy, too hard. Stop. Well, Jesus reacts to Mary's grip in that same way. Do not hold on to me. But his rebuke to Mary is not about being squished in her arms. It's about the reality of death and resurrection and what it means. Do not hold on to this dead body, Mary. I have things that I am called to you to do, and so do you. Let's go. Do not hold on to this dead body. It is the past, and the past will not change. Let go. Do not hold on to this dead body. It cannot mend your broken dreams. Let go. Do not hold on to this dead body. The only way out of your darkness is to move ahead. Let go. Mary, we cannot stay here. What you miss and what you long for is dead. Let go. Move forward. Invite others to join you on the journey. Don't turn back to the past, but look to the future with trust. Because just as I have been transformed, so will you be. Let go. Let's go. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me. 
and he tells me I am his own. And the joys we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So here's the deal. Whenever we think we've got a hold of Jesus, he will ask us to let him go. Whether our holding on has to do with the comfort of his present during difficult times, or an image of him we have clung to since childhood, whether that's a positive or a negative image or whether it's the particular way we have grown used to being and doing church, we mustn't hold on. We mustn't hold on because Jesus has places he wants to take us, people he wants us to meet. He will comfort us in our sorrow when we are devastated by our loss, but he will not allow us to stay at the tomb. The tomb is a place that is safe. It's predictable. Boring. Dead. And guess what? Jesus is not there. He's not there. So why should we be? He has other plans for us. And his plan is the same as it was for Mary and the rest of the disciples. Resurrection, surprise, amazement, joy incomprehensible, and wonder. So here's the message. Lose your fear, whatever it is. Forget about comfort. Embrace this new adventure and make a mad dash after the mysterious stranger who invites you to participate in God's magnificent, surprising, and unpredictable plan for your life. Don't hold on to his dead body. Let go. And don't worry, you won't be alone for, and now we have to change the words to the refrain a little. He walks with us and he talks with us and he tells us we are his own and the joy we share as we tarry there. The faithful have ever known, the faithful have ever known. Again and again, Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Amen.